Okay, so we're going to move on to later Etruscan art. Um, so in 509 BCE, the Romans expelled the last Etruscan king and replaced the monarchy with a republic. And in 474, the Greeks dominated the Etruscan naval fleet. And these two blows ended Etruscan prosperity and dominance. So we'll get into the kind of the classical period of art with the Etruscans, similar to the classical Greek art. Um, so after the Etruscans were knocked down a peg by both the Greeks and the Romans, Etruscan art went through some changes. Uh, the elaborate rock-cut tombs began to lessen in number, and the Etruscans were not as well off as they once were, so they could not afford the expensive Greek vases that they would have imported and placed in their tombs, or the elaborate murals in their tombs as well. So the tombs get more modest, and even though the Etruscan tombs became more rare and less elaborate, Etruscans still made um, strides in art. So they were very successful with the casting of bronze statues and in terracotta as well. So this is the Capitoline Wolf from Rome, Italy, 500 to 480 BCE, or possibly 12th century. Uh, it's bronze, two feet, seven and a half inches high. Um, so this piece is called the Capitoline Wolf, and it was originally thought to be a later Etruscan piece. Um, it was well known that the infants were later additions that were added in the 15th century. And as you can clearly see, they are done in a much more refined style than the she-wolf. Um, so they're definitely, this one looks more primitive, uh, and these look much, much different style, more refined, um, something that you would see in the 15th century. Um, and the she-wolf is a different color as well, of bronze. So recently, the she-wolf went through a restoration, and the restoration, the restorer actually saw that um, this was actually cast using the lost wax method, um, which is a technique that was regularly employed by the Etruscan artists, but it was actually, it wasn't done all in one piece, uh, or actually it was done in all in one piece, which was not something that was developed until much later. So the fact that sh this she-wolf was done in one piece is something that the Etruscans did not have the ability to do. That was something that was developed later. So they're thinking that this is more of a medieval piece because the stylistic, um, the style of it parallels medieval art. So now it's thought that this piece is a product of the 12th century, um, possibly an Italian foundry. So basically the story of the she-wolf goes like this. Um, this is kind of the mythology behind the she-wolf and the symbolism behind the she-wolf is that the um, infants Romulus and Remus, who are pictured down here, um, were abandoned and a wolf found them and nursed them to health, helped rear them, and the brothers grew, grew older and eventually Romulus killed his brother and it's said that he founded Rome and became the city's first king. So he, one of these um, two, which was Romulus, killed his brother and, and eventually became the first king of Rome. So that's kind of where that mythology comes from and the, the she-wolf you know, supposedly made these guys strong and wild and particularly um, cutthroat, I guess, in some ways. So this is called the Chimera of Arezzo from Arezzo, Arezzo Italy. Uh, first half of 4th century BCE, it's bronze, two feet, seven and a half inches high. Uh, this work is known as an Etruscan masterpiece. Um, it's called the Chimera of Arzeo, Arzeo um, and was inscribed with an instruction with an Etruscan gift to the god uh, Tinea, which is Zeus. And this tells us that it's a votive offering to the god, and it's meant to be placed in a sanctuary. And the Chimera is actually a Greek composite creature, which consists of a lion's body and a serpent's tail. Um, and it has a second head that is actually a goat's head, and you can see the goat's head is kind of wounded and bleeding. Um, actually, you can't see it very well because it's kind of off to the side back here, but it's actually in this piece, it's wounded and, and bleeding. Um, but the Chimera um, refuses to surrender, and it seems like it is preparing to attack, and that it's roaring out of its open mouth, and the statue is probably originally 
a part of a larger group that included um, the Greek hero that is said to have hunted and killed this mythological beast. So that's actually really a, a very beautiful statue. So we're going to get into Hellenistic art and the rise of Rome. During the Hellenistic period in Etruria, the Romans began to appropriate Etruscan territory, and the major Etruscan city of Veii fell to the Romans. Um, next came the city of Tarquinia, and then in 273 BCE, the Romans conquered the city of Cerviteri. Um, so we'll take a look at this piece. It's called um, Assiste which is a cylindrical container for women's toiletries. And it's made of a sheet of bronze that was cast. It actually has cast feet and handles that are cast. Um, and <clears throat> there are these engravings on the surface as well. And this is one is called the Ficaroni Sista and it's from Palestrina, Italy. And it's quite large, two feet, six inches high. And it has this inscription on the handle that states that a local noblewoman gave the sista to her daughter, and the artist was Novios of Platinos, or Platios, sorry, who was, you know, um, had actually had a workshop in Rome. So this is a good indicator that Rome was becoming an important cultural and political center as well during this time. And the engraving on this piece shows that the Greek mythology, it shows a Greek mythology, mythological story of the Argonauts who were a crew of the ship of the called the Argo and basically the Argonauts go on this epic journey in search for this golden fleece and it's thought that the motif featured on the Sista is an adaptation of a lost Greek panel painting that was on display in Rome at this time and the figures on the piece do feature um, the experimentation with different views of the human body as you can see up here and some figures are seen entirely from behind or in three-quarter view and many of the figures do share do not share a common ground line so you can see all the figures that are etched onto the surface or carved into the surface um, so they're all at different levels uh, not a common ground line which is consistent what's going on with what's going on in greek panel painting we talked about that and greek vase painting during this time so Etruria is is kind of paralleling a lot of the things that are happening in Greece right now um, with this piece anyway. So we're going to take a look at this piece next. Um, it's from the 3rd century BCE. The Etruscans of Perugia formed alliance with Rome and they were actually spared the destruction that the major Etruscan cities suffered, the other major cities suffered at the hands of the Romans because they did form an alliance. And this is called the Porta Marzia, which is the Gate of Mars. And it's shown here and it features um, trapezoidal shaped stones and they are held in place um, against each other basically. Here, so these are the trapezoid shaped stones here. Um, And they form this arched gateway and the central stone is actually called, I believe, I think it's up in here, you know, somewhere in the center of the arch. That's actually called a keystone. So we'll take a look at arch construction. Similar arches have been documented earlier um, in Greece and Mesopotamia, but in Etruria and Rome, the arch Archicated gates and freestanding triumphal arches become major architectural pieces and ideas. So the Etruscans and the Romans really use the arch a lot. And these um, engaged columns on this piece frame in the arch on either side. So engaged means that they're still connected to the background fabric. So we have engaged columns. They're not freestanding. They're not completely in the round. Um, and these are sculpted half figures of Jupiter and his sons Castor and Pollux and their horses and they're peering out in between the engaged columns. So you can see some of their horses and Castor and Pollux and, and Jupiter are up in here. 
I'm not quite sure who exactly these people are, but um, <clears throat> so we'll take a look at a sarcophagus of Lars Pulena from Tarquinia, Italy, 220 to 180 BCE. It's about six feet six inches long, so this is Hellenistic in style. The sarcophagus began to be made from stone during this period instead of terracotta, and this sarcophagus was carved by an Etruscan sculptor in 220 to 180 BCE, and it actually contained the remains of Lars Pulena, and the relief scene on the front shows the deceased between two demons that swing these hammers, two vants, which are winged female demons, um, on either side of those stand to left and right, and that shows that Lars made the journey into the afterlife successfully. And above, he re kind of reclines on this couch, which is typical of um, Etruscan art. And he is not at a festive banquet with his wife, like the other one that we've looked at. And it's clear he is middle-aged, and this is symbolic of the times. The Etruscans are not living the decadence that they once did during earlier times, and it's harder for the people now, and the economy is in decline. And Lars is actually holding an open scroll that has a list of his life's achievements on it. So you can see that here. And he also wears a wreath around his neck and sort of a, a certain headdress on his head, so that's kind of interesting. And we have one more piece here that we were going to look at. I just need to make sure I have enough time. Okay. So this is Elue Metele uh, from Cortona, Italy, 1st century BCE, bronze, 5 feet 7 inches high. This is one of the latest works produced for an Etruscan patron. And it's made of bronze, and it portrays the magistrate, Alue Metele. Um, he raises his arms to address the crowd. He was actually a famous or orator during this time, and it's a life-size statue. It dates from the first century BCE, and it proves that the Etruscans continue to be experts at bronze casting. And the lifetime for this piece, or the time frame for this piece, coincides with Rome totally dominating Etruria. So Roman citizenship was really enforced in all of Italy's inhabitants, including the Etruscans. And this orator actually wears a short toga and high boots of um, a Roman magistrate. And his haircut is closely cropped like many Romans of the day. So this orator is Etruscan in name and birth, but he's dressed as a Roman. So we're kind of seeing this shift in Etruria to basically becoming Roman. And this piece is kind of symbolic of the fact that Etruscan art has become Roman art, and Etruria has really been enveloped by the powerful force that is Rome at this time. And so basically they kind of just absorb Etruria, Rome does, and they kind of become a part of Rome. Um, and that pretty much concludes the chapter, so we'll see you next time.